now it's time to introduce you a bit later to introduce you uh, Judith Rousseau from University of Oxford. She's very known in the Bayesian and non-Bayesian community. And she's presenting uh, a speech on a speech on our density living in, in a near. So thank you, uh, Judith, for coming. The audience is open. I think it's well. I am supposed to bring it here. Sorry. Well, so, why is it them can just put it in the pocket? Yeah, it's pretty better. Than that. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank the scientific committee and the organizing committee for inviting me. It's amazing, it's a beautiful place and it's great to see the old friends and it's a very interesting conference. Um, so I'm not going to give you an overview of something. It's more like some kind of work I've done recently. Uh, I've learned about a manifold which I had no idea about before. And so I'm going to try to describe what the problem is. And it's a joint work with a PhD student uh, in Paris, Clément Berenfeld. So it's a, he's just finished. He's, a, he's extremely smart. And uh, another PhD student of mine in Oxford, Paul Rosa, who's also very intelligent. And so, uh, and they know all about manifolds. So the, I, uh, I'm going to describe the motivation, which is dimension reduction. Uh, so there, there are connections to what Irene was talking about, but we take a nice sort of a simpler point of view here. And then how we answer the problem. So it's like we have to formalize it mathematically. So there is a certain point of view there. And uh, it's all about smoothness. And so, and then the Bayesian approach, I'm going to describe the prior, which is sort of the overview aspect of my talk and the theory. Uh, so motivation, so uh, low dimensional structure, what do we mean by that? So you are in a high dimensional data set maybe. Uh, so here D equals two, so it's not super high. Um, but uh, you think that your data actually lives somewhere like much more reduced. So for instance, here, uh, can you see my, yeah. So here the, the points seem to be along a curve or something like that. Uh, or more specifically, they, they seem to be in a tube, which is very narrow, okay. And that's what I mean by close to a low dimensional manifold. So the manifold would be this black curve and it lives close to this black curve. And um, so a manifold, I mean, it's more general than a curve, but it's a bit like a curve. Uh, so there are physical, there are like, I mean, in the, it's all over the place, the dimension reduction is, is called nonlinear dimension reduction. Um, there are physical examples or chemical examples in the literature. So here it was found by Clément uh, Berenfeld. Um, so the, the, the data lives in this sort of 70 and something uh, dimension because it's all the conformal conformations of uh, molecules. And, uh, but what happens is because you have these constraints in between the different atoms, um, some, physics, some chemists show that uh, actually it lives in this two dimensional sort of manifold. Uh, so that's one example. There are loads of them. The other ones are in, in image. So in like, that's the sort of typical set setup where you sort of think that you could have like a dimensional reduction. It's a huge dimensional set setup because there are images. So you have all the pixels, but essentially like for instance here, this is the coil data set and the images are of cats. They are all the same, but it's just the rotation that changes. And so instead of being into this sort of huge uh, dimension, it's essentially one dimensional uh, behind. And so, um, so that's the uh, sort of the idea behind this idea, uh, this sort of dimension reduction setups. So I'm going to skip that. So because I'm not the most uh, applied person on earth, so um, uh, that would be my example, <laughs> essentially. So it's like, um, that would be, so th that's what we do. So they are where the, the experiments that we've done so far. So the, uh, so it looks like the data live on a curve, but it's not exactly the case. They live close to a curve. So the data is the blue points. So are the blue points and they are close to this spiral. And uh, we run our algorithms. And so th this is a sort of the, the thing that works the best. But what I want to talk about is that sort of that, that's the method. If you do density estimation from a Bayesian point of view, what you would do, you would typically use a Dirichlet process mixture of normals 
And to make your life easy, you're going to use as a base measure in the Dirichlet process the uh, conjugate distribution. And it doesn't work. And so that's a bit what I want to talk about today, why it doesn't work and what might work. So, uh, so now that's why do we want to do that? Uh, so that this is, as I said before, you want to do dimension reduction. So the typical dimension reduction things that existed so far are linear. So like PCA, you, it's a bit different because you you want to represent your data by something much more much smaller. While what we are doing is we want to estimate the density of the data, thinking that there is something smaller, but we are not representing the data by something smaller. Uh, but so. Um, here we want to get away from linear, so we don't want to project on subspaces or think that there is something on subspaces, but we wanted to make it nonlinear, and that's where the manifold comes in. So it's just a sort of nonlinear version of what exists. So um, quite a lot of uh, results imply that the data live on the manifold. It might be a bit uh, reductive in a sense because typically there is noise in the data, and so the, the data live around the manifold, and that's our idea with the tube, the sort of the blue tube we had. And so essentially you have a, you, you sort of think that there is a signal on a manifold, but you have a noisy version of it. And what you observe is around this manifold. Uh, and that's where we sit. That's where, that's our point of view. So uh, now I get into the sort of the hard crossing. Uh, so, so M is my manifold. I don't know M. My data is XI and it lives in RD, but it, it lives in a, in a tube around the manifold, which I don't know. So what do I mean by that? I'm considering this sort of blue area, which is all the points that are close to this dark area, which is my manifold. And the manifold is a, is a lower dimensional manifold. So in a, essentially, it can be represented by less variables than my capital D. OK, so in the setup, the manifold is unknown. The, the size of the tube is unknown. Uh, the dimension of my manifold is unknown, so you don't know anything. And what you're interested in is this density. You want to estimate the density of your observations. We, being agnostic to all these sort of parameters, you want to make as little uh, uh, assumptions as possible. And But you still have to assume a few things. So you, we're going to assume that the manifold is well behaved. So what does it mean is that it's smooth. So it's like a smooth curve. And it's, uh, the, it doesn't have like sharp edges. So in other words, the second derivative of the parameterization is uh, doesn't blow up. So it, and and also you so manifold so you can make it like a, for instance uh, you could have something like that. So it's called a bottleneck. So you don't have bottleneck. Actually, in our case, we manage to get away. So we can have bottlenecks, but we cannot allow for these sort of sharp edges. That's a sort of the only constraint. So the, when you do density estimation, it's a well-known fact that uh, if your density is smooth then it's easier because you, you need less parameters to represent it. And so it's, you have uh, less quantities to estimate. And so, so here, so it's a bit like in the realm of anisotropic density estimation, but anisotropic density estimations corresponds to along some axes, you can have a number of derivatives that you can allow. And along the different axes, you have less derivatives or more derivatives. That's what it means, anisotropic. But here we want to have the same ideas, but except of being along axes, which are fixed, we want to be along the manifold. So we have to define, so that's what I'm going to try to explain, how to define these ideas of what we call anisotropic smoothness driven uh, densities. So yeah, so that's um, when you have a, a nice be well, nicely behaved manifold, you can split it into these uh, patches, these gray patches here. So you have a, a finite or a countable number of these gray patches if it's a non-compact manifold. And the idea is that in each of these patch, like here, so here my uh, blue tube is become yellow. So this is sort of uh, my tube around my manifold where my data live. And I don't know the, it, but so in these patches, you can uh, find a nice parameterization. So it's a bit like in physics, uh, well, I, I was very bad in physics, but you, uh, you had to, when you were looking at a, at a mobile, at a moved, uh, you, were, you had this local, parameterization, local uh, parameterization, and that's exactly the same idea. So you want to construct a local parameterization along the manifold, where sort of that sort of follows the geometry of your manifold. And so what you're going to do is that in these uh, uh, patches, you're going to be able to construct a local parameterization so that you sort of for, forget that you're not, you, you are in this weird geometry, but you go back to the Euclidean geometry. That's what we're doing. So that's my uh, patch here. 
And so when you but manifold is well behaved, it, it has nothing to do with the density of the observation, no? it's just a manifold. When the manifold is well behaved, you can construct a transformation from your manifold to this Euclidean space locally. So the manifold is a blue curve, so it's a d-dimensional object, little d-dimensional object there, and it becomes this axis, x-axis. And the, uh, the normal to the manifold is this black curve, and it becomes this uh, y-axis here, okay? And so now, so in this new parameterization, I can, uh, so that's f of x becomes uh, f bar of uh, v, uh, v and eta in my uh, Euclidean uh, coordinates, okay? But I, you remember that we are thinking that our, our data live close to the manifold, so it's, it's in a very narrow tube. And because we want to think that so there is dimension reduction, it has to be very narrow. Otherwise, there is no dimension reduction. You're back to our capital D. And so, and if you if a data leads to a very, you know, in a very narrow bound, then it means that the density explodes. So you have to get rid of these explosions. And so we have to reparameterize in a way that sort of scale invariant. And so that's this F bar delta. So F bar delta corresponds to the fact that somehow you have scaled along the Y axis. So that it, it goes back to something a bit as if you were on zero one along the y axis. So it's just a parameterization trick. And now we are living locally on this object, which is nicely behaved. And I can consider anis Helder anisotropy. So on this sort of new parameterization. And that's how we define this um, M, so manifold Helder anisotropic densities. It's a very fancy name for just saying that you're working. So you're working on this weird object, you make a change of parameterization so that locally in each of these patch, you have this, this nice Euclidean space. And now there you are uh, anisotropic. So you have a certain smoothness along the manifold and a different smoothness uh, uh, along the normal to the manifold. And typically why you, why you might think something like that is because if you think about the idea that you, you were along a manifold, so your data sits on the manifold, but you have some noise, you sort of think that the noise is smooth. Okay, so that's at least that's what we think. So we so we saw that the kind of model we have in mind. So so the observation, the signal might not be, have a density which is so smooth, but it's noisy and the noise is smooth. Okay, and so and surprising lot in it, so that's a uh, yeah that's um, it looks a bit artificial, but uh, what I'm what I'm want to say is that actually it covers the examples of. Uh, that you find in the literature that talk about uh, data living close to a manifold. And the typical examples are the one where you have the data where X that's Y plus noise, as I said, and this noise is scaled by some delta and delta is small. And uh, so some uh, authors have been interested in these kind of models, for instance, when the, the noise is lives on the on the normal to the manifold. It's called this orthogonal noise mo models by Wasserstein, and they are, their aim was to, reco to reconstruct the manifold. But here our aim is easier. We just want to estimate the overall density. Uh, the other example is the iso isotropic noise. So you, the epsilon uh, is like normal, for instance, in the Gaussian noise. And, um, and, and so this, there are papers there where people are interested in estimating the density when you, are, you have isotropic noise. And so, so the idea is that the noise is smooth, but the signal is not so smooth. And so you, you want, and, but then what's funny is that even though you have a, like a super smooth noise, so you can think, okay, my, now my, so my density should be super smooth, but because it lives in the very narrow point, it's not so smooth anymore. And so that's why you need to have this sort of a, a driven uh, um, smoothness, so manifold driven smoothness. So beta naught is a smoothness along the curve, and beta perp is a smoothness normal to the curve. And typically beta perp is larger than beta naught. And what we want is uh, now formally, mathematically show that if you are in a setup like that, then you can construct estimators uh, whose rate of convergence will be driven by this beta naught and beta perp and little d and capital D. Yeah, that's uh, so how do we now, and we want to be Bayesian, so we're going to construct a Bayesian prior and to look at which kind of prior you can work. And so um, I'm going to use the board. Um, so the prior I know most is like Gaussian mixtures. And so Gaussian mixtures have been around. And so I'm going to use them here just to work. So if you have to, you, in the literature so far, you have two types of Gaussian mixtures, location mixtures and location scale mixtures. So location mixtures corresponds to saying that you have uh, PJs 
and then phi sigma of x minus mu j. So this is location because sigma is the same for all components. I'm not sure. So here I'm not saying whether I have infinite mixtures or not or mixture of five mixtures. They are all the same in my hand, in my head. What's important is whether it's location or not location. So location mixtures will have the same sigma for everyone. And uh, location scale mixtures. So I should actually put a sigma there. It's uh, the same here, but I'm allowing the sigma to vary across my components. Okay, that's location scale. And I'm going to talk about these guys all the time. And so that's why I wanted to have these two uh, well. -fit. So there are words uh, for no manifold story, but if you have data on RD, there, are, there exists quite a lot of work now on, on how these objects work well or not well for density estimation. Okay. And um, what's funny is that uh, for location mixture, who, which look much more constrained, so they should be less good in a sense. Uh, you can prove that if you have some kind of homogeneity, so if the smoothness is the same everywhere and you don't have a, an isotropy either, they are the best in a sense. So like you can prove a minimax rate of estimations, it's completely adaptive, you don't have to know the smoothness, and it, they, they are very nice objects. Uh, strangely enough, the location scale mixture are not the same. In a sense, they are too free. So these are, it's a too complex a model in a sense. And well, there is no theory that says that they don't work. There is a theory that says that the result we obtain when we try to make them work don't work. But it's not quite the same. So the we don't we, there is, we don't know whether the results are sharp or not because proving that things don't work with mixtures is a hell. So um, but empirically, empirically, as I was saying in my first sort of plots, they don't work so well in our context. And we were not the, the, the first to find them. Like uh, there was this nice paper by Dunton and Mitchell Padier who work in the same context as us. And they also found that these Dirichlet process mixtures with uh, sort of the usual uh, conjugate uh, base measure do not work well. So that's a, a bit like sort of a one takeoff message is that you have to be super careful on the way you put your prior on pit to the, uh, these guys, whether you put it like that and how you construct your structure. Uh, so we're going to um, look at something a bit different. So it's a bit like a version sophisticated, which is a hierarchical version of the location scale mixture. And by being hierarchical, we are going to constrain things a little more, and that allow us to make it work. Um, so the kind of two kind of mixtures that are going to work are the following: one we call partial location scale mixtures, and it's partial because. You, you remember that you want to follow some curve, so it's not flat, okay? And so if you want to follow some curve, it means that you need to be able to find the right directions for your local parameterization in a sense. And that, so, which means that essentially you want to meet, so you don't necessarily want to meet the whole sigma, but you want to be able to have the, com the, the components to have different directions, so different uh, rotation matrix in, front of, in your parameterization of your sigma. So you parameterize, you parameterize the covariance matrices by these O transpose lambda O. So lambda are the diagonal, so these are the eigenvalues of your covariance matrices, and O are the rotation matrices. So, the, so just this sort of parameterization where you are in, the, in your space. And so you, oops, so here your your each component has a different O and a different Newton location, but they all share the same eigenvalues in the covariance matrix. And for the hybrid mixture, it's a little more sophisticated. So you can have different eigenvalues, so which sort of in your head, it's, it's a, it might be good if you think that in some region of your space, you have a certain smoothness, and in some other regions of the space, you have a different smoothness. And then you want to have different types of eigenvalues because somehow the, I, the smoothness uh, uh, is a sort of thought about as the eigenvalues in your covariance matrix. And so, and one way to do that, if you don't want to be too flexible and make it work, is consider a hierarchical prior. So I'm, I'm talking here about the Dirichlet process. So P follows the Dirichlet process, which has a base measure. So Dirichlet processes correspond to looking at objects like that, so infinite mixtures. The P's follow some distributions uh, that are sort of independent of the atoms, and the atoms are ID with respect to the base measure. So here, if I have a full Dirichlet process mixture, the atoms are mu, O, and lambda. 
and they are ID with, uh, with, uh, with respect to this base measure. And this base measure is, can be anything from U and O, it's fine, but you want it to be uh, also a random variable for the lambdas. So you have this hierarchical Dirichet process where given the distribution from the lambdas, there are, uh, you have a Dirichet process with this distribution, and then the lambda has a distribution which is itself the Dirichet process. And that allows you to share information upon components. So in other words, you can have the same lambdas for some of the components and different lambdas for different components, and you can do whatever you want, and that makes you flexible enough, but not too flexible, and, it, and things, the theory goes through. Okay, so what theory? Um, so the theory, uh, I'm, so it's, uh, I'm going to skip a lot of the details under the carpet there, but the idea is that if you, so if you assume that you have this anisotropic smoothness, okay, F not, is a, so it has a smoothness that follows the, the, your manifold with a different direction. So along the manifold, it has smoothness beta not, and a, a normal to the manifold, it has this smoothness beta perp, and beta perp is larger than beta not. That's your idea. Um, you don't know anything. You put your Dirichet process mixtures, and either you do the partial location or the hybrid hybrid location scale version. And what you get at the end of the day, and there's sort of the usual assumption, is that the posterior contraction rate in L1. So you want to estimate the density. You you look at the L loss, which is the L1 loss for the for the density estimation, is uh, the the minimum rate of estimation. I'm going to describe a little bit what it means here. So the rate of contraction has this is n to the power minus something. And uh, one interesting case is that when beta perp, so this is normal to the manifold, you're infinitely smooth, like Gaussian noise. Okay. So if you have like something like that, then what you get at the rate of convergence is n minus beta naught over two beta naught plus little d, which is exactly the rate that you would get if you were in little d dimensional space, but you are in capital D dimension. So you, did, you manage to have this dimensional reduction there, you're happy. In a sense, this is only true if the, the narrow, your tube is not too narrow. And now we don't know whether this is sharp or not, whether we, we are not allowed to prove it, or is maybe there is something going on there, we don't know. Uh, of course, if beta perp is not infinite, you have this term that comes from the side that you, you do not live in a digital d-dimensional space, but in a capital and the space is capital d-dimensional. And so this is the sort of perturbation. What you know is that this rate here, this part, is, mi is minimax. And how do you know that? Is because a sub a subcase of our case is when the manifold is flat. So if the manifold is a subspace, then the, uh, there there are results that exist for the, in the case of anisotropic density estimation. And in the case of anisotropic density estimation, the rate of convergence uh, is exactly that one. And because it's a subspace of our case, then we know that it's the minimax rate of estimation. So these are, and it's, this is very nice in a sense because, uh, and, and I don't want to sell the, I, like the best way of honor, so I'm just saying that what's amazing is that you're using a very old tool, which is mixture of normals to estimate the density. You're just being a bit careful on the way you're designing your prior or your mixtures, and you adapt to everything. Like you don't know M, you don't know delta, and it seems to like, as far as theory is concerned, it seems to work very well. So now a bit of, um, so why, what was the trick to make it work? And uh, don't worry, but yeah, there isn't too many, too many things forever because it's just default. But um, so when you prove that sort of results, how do you think about this object? The main uh, sort of uh, difficulty is to find a way to approximate a smooth function, if not your density, by these mixtures, okay? And so it's a bit like kernel, uh, kernel estimation. So in kernel estimation, what you do, is you approximate F naught by K sigma of F naught. The amazing thing with mixtures is that uh, if you do that, if you ha only have, if the only possibility was to approximate F naught by K sigma of F naught, then you'll be restricted by the kind of kernel that you use, like here, Gaussian kernel, and you would be only good for densities that are C2. And if you have smoother densities, then it's not good. With mixtures, you're not trying to do that, but with mixtures, you try to approximate F naught by some k sigma of f1, and f1 can be different from f0. And the sort of the thing that sort of made uh, our life change when we are studying uh, mixtures, which was like dating from location mixtures, actually, was that, that by doing that, you can access densities that are smooth for any kind of mixture. So this is true for any smoothness beta. 
And also that's much more flexible. These mixtures, they are much more flexible than kernels. They're also much more complex, unfortunately. But so here, contrary-wise to these uh, location mixtures where you have the same sigma for everyone, when you try to, to when you do something like that, for location mixtures, what we, what we proved uh, many years ago was to say that if you have sigma that's the same for every component and sigma goes to zero, so you imagine one dimensional object, then uh, you, ha you have these results. But here, because we want to adapt to where we are and each, each local patch has a different uh, parameterization, you want sigma to move across the components. And so the, uh, the difficulty was to find a way to design uh, this uh, approximating uh, sigma mu. So this is not something that you have to think about when you construct your prior. This is something you have to think about when you want to understand the behavior of the posterior. So it's just for the theoretical tools. And so one way to, to think about the sigma u was to have this O transpose lambda O. So it's only O that depends on the location. And it's this O, this rotation is purely the projection along the tangent space and the normal space on your manifold. And that's that's that. And once you have figured it out, where it's technical, but then you can prove that this sort of weird object which is now, it's not a, a kernel of estimator anymore because it's doesn't necessarily integrate to one, but uh, this sort of weird operator on F actually has this very nice property. Okay, and, and that gives you all the freedom you want to adapt to everything because your prior doesn't depend on beta, the prior doesn't depend on B, it depends on nothing. This construction depends on everything, but it's a purely theoretical construction that you use to prove. It doesn't, uh, uh, the prior doesn't depend on the construction itself. That's what I want to say. So now to make our life a little more pleasant uh, simulation. So we didn't simulate the hybrid, which is more complicated. And we don't, I don't know how, I haven't, I mean, it's probably not so easy to simulate for the posterior distribution. So we did the partial location scale uh, prior. So when you, you mix, so the, the scale, the covariance can vary across components, but only in terms of the rotation matrix is both. So, O varies, uh, so you have a, a P on mu and O, and lambda is the same for every component. So we put a little process for P here, and the lambda J's are IV uh, inverse gamma. Uh, in theory, there should be the square root of lambda J to be IV inverse gamma, but uh, mm. it didn't work too bad in this case. And then there are two cases in our simulation one where you, you fix the basis and so the provide. The, the hyperparameter in your covariance matrix along the, for the eigenvalues, or you put the prior on the BJs. And um, again, I'm going to show that, uh, like, as far as theory is concerned, it shouldn't matter, but in practice, it makes a lot of a difference. So, and that's what we were. So, this, this is just like a very simple example. So, it's capital B equals two, little b equals one. So, the data lives in a cube and in, in a very sort of 0 0.0, 0 0.12 or 0 0.01 cube along, uh, along this sort of manifold, which is just uh, this uh, parabola. And uh, just to illustrate the, behave, the sort of performance of our approach, we simulated data. So, the, the blue dots are the true observations, and the red dots are simulated from the posterior predictive density. So, the, so that they are predictions from your density estimator. So, and we simulated as many points as uh, we observed points. So, the, the, there are as many red dots as there are blue dots. And so, so here, there are, it corresponds to the particle prior, the one where the big J's, uh, so the big J's are, are exponential one. So, we didn't try to be particularly clever, we just put the prior on the big J's. Here, it's like when we choose the big J to be quite small. And here, when big J becomes large, so all of a sudden, it's not so good. And that's and this one is a Gaussian uh, mixture location scale Gaussian mixture with the conjugate prior of the base as the base measure, so it's not the good. It's the one I said didn't work so well. It doesn't work so well. So here, what it shows is that you have to be careful about the even the hyper prior that you put on the the, the way you think about your lambda, as I said. So the, a little more. So that's the, the graph I was showing. So now you are on a spiral, but it's the same story. Um, and here we have a work with a different delta, so you can play also with delta in our simulation studies. What I wanted to show is that so there was this assumption of the fact that there is this switch 
condition for the manifold, which says that there is no bottleneck or no two deep curves, two deep uh, angles. Uh, bottleneck don't matter. So this is a bottleneck. Here you have a bottleneck because there is a crossing in your manifold. And it doesn't matter because you're using mixtures. And so you can think about like a mixture of this circle and that circle. And mixtures work, so so you don't so bottlenecks are not a problem for our problem. It's the only condition is really the curvature. You cannot you cannot allow for bad curvature. And so these are these are the two observations, and these are the symmetric versions from our estimators. Uh, and it's only uh, so it's only three hundred observations, so it's not a huge data set. So it's a and now same algorithm. We didn't change anything of the algorithms, and it's only in dimension three. So. So, but we run the same algorithms. Uh, so here it's a three, so capital D is three, but the middle D is one. And uh, uh, I think we have a thousand observations here. So these are the two observations, similarly data. So they look pretty much the same. There is no, we didn't try to measure the error because it becomes a bit of a headache here, but it's, so it's just visual effects. So take it as it is, it's not like a, a very very uh, um, rigorous way of assessing the performance of our algorithms. But what's funny is that so we run the same algorithms now on this data set, which is a uh, little d equals two, and it's amazing. It looks so good. <laughs> I'm not saying it's very good. I'm just saying it looks good. Huh? It's just it's a different story. Um, so just uh, to uh, summarize uh, the story, um, there are still quite a lot of open questions there. One is that. Uh, uh, actually, I've been cheating a bit when I was doing my, my, my simulations. I didn't say what was what and what kind of algorithms that we used. So here we use the deep sampler algorithms. So that's sort of the basic kind of algorithms for the Dirichlet process mixture of normals. Uh, it's a quite slow. Uh, so because it's deep sampler and in many dimensions, so it's not the best. Uh, so the one question is how to make it much more efficient and what kind of algorithm could you use if you wanted to do MCMC? Here, it was super fast, but we didn't use a deep sampler, we used a map. So we use a variational based approach. In sense. So it's a map, but it's, you can compute it using these tools that are, so there are like libraries, uh, uh, software that exist that do it for you. And so we didn't even program it, we use the software. And that's what it, that's how it works. But that's just then you just get the point estimator. You don't get measures of uncertainty. And so how can we go from one to the other and improve the things? I don't know, but there is definitely something to do there because the aim of the game is to work with large V. And for the moment, large V in our case was three, so it's okay, so we're not there. But uh, there, uh, but it's it should. Uh, I mean, if someone comes up with a very a good scalable algorithms, it it might be an interesting tool because to estimate the density in high dimensions. Um, uh, and for me, a, a big uh, takeoff me message, uh, in particular for people who do Bayesian parametrics, is that um, don't use the, the convicted version as a default. Uh, it's, you really have to think carefully on the way you think about your prior on P. Because, I mean, conjugate is, makes the algorithm much simpler, but it, it really doesn't adapt to anything. And so, uh, if you have something to adapt to, then it's uh, you should be careful. Be careful on the way you design your prior on the, on the mixing distribution. It makes a whole lot of a difference, and not only in practice, but also in theory. Or maybe I should say, not only in theory, but also in practice. Whatever. <laughs> um, uh, another open question is um, so to tell you the full story, actually. Uh, so we present it now as saying it's a, it's a generalization of uh, data living on the manifold. We started by looking at around the manifold because we didn't know how to play with on the manifold, to be honest. But, uh, so the idea is that it would be quite nice to see if there is something, uh, if we were able to pass at the limit to get delta going to zero and our stable results were stable, uh, whatever the value of delta. So here delta can be a little of one, but it cannot be too small. And here, um, as far as our results are concerned, uh, when delta is too small, the rates that we get are not the optimal rate anymore. And we don't know whether because they shouldn't be, because somehow the minimax rate depends also on delta, or whether they should be, and we well, the either the prior that we're using is not the right one, or maybe because the way of, of our proof works, 
makes it accessible to Mula. I don't know. It's so, so that to me could put me an open question. From a Bison point of view, um, if you wanted to do density estimation on an unknown body fold, then you are working on a on the project which on the problem which is not um, dominated so the models are not dominated because the support changes with your model and so all of a sudden it becomes super complicated and for me the sort of probably the best way to think about it is more like a, do something like the Dirichet process and instead of looking at density estimation you look at distribution estimation and instead of l1 distance then it becomes a Wasserstein and it's a different problem in a sense but um, yeah, there are open questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith, for your nice talk. Now we move to the discussion. The first discussion is Professor Sonia Petrone from Bocconi University. Thank you, Sonia, for being here and for accepting to discuss this nice work of uh, Judith. Okay. Um, ah. Um, grazie, thank you, merci, Judith, uh, for having been uh, so clear in your uh, talk because I read the paper. I thought I understood, I was so proud of myself. I kind of understood, but no, there were many things I didn't understand. And I think I understood a bit better with your presentation. Um, so thank you for the organizing and, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to to discuss this. Uh, I, I was in, so this, my discussion is based on the draft paper or almost finished or finished paper that uh, uh, Judith uh, sent me uh, a bit in advance. And, um, and so I read the paper, I found it the really impressive work. Uh, uh, the problem is interesting, I think is a co of current interest in many areas. The approach uh, that uh, is taken uh, density estimation, I find it uh, statistically neat, uh, clear. And then, as we know, density estimation can be a first step towards other applications. Uh, the work, uh, uh, the paper is very rich, dense. So there is a lot of work uh, because of, uh, it is in this area of uh, frequentist properties of Bayesian procedures, syntotic frequentist properties. Uh, but uh, the kind of density, the kind of problem we want to study, I found it uh, new, in, at least in this area. Uh, so there is really a lot of work in the preliminary formalization, mathematical formalization of the problem. As we have seen, I found, uh, to my knowledge, a new, uh, elegant uh, uh, notion of anisotropic uh, holder smoothness uh, for this problem. Uh, I think if I understood that, uh, and then uh, it goes back to the usual smoothness uh, when uh, you are not in the... Uh, so I found that the elegant, uh, the new and careful choice of the prior. Uh, so this methodological contribution and then uh, prove the results. Uh, and uh, it's impressive that the rates, uh, at least in the setting, are, uh, can be optimal and are adaptive. Uh, and then uh, the paper I found, the paper and the presentation, it's very technical, but very well explained. And you really give the intuition of what's going on and illustrated in dimension three, but uh, also illustrated. So I, I would uh, comment, make just three comments uh, um, in, uh, in different order about the prior, about the rates and about uh, uh, three. I think I have many slides for saying nothing when Judith has 20 slides for such uh, this uh, whole uh, work. So uh, the first is about the prior. Uh, so we have, uh, well, basically the problem is XI, uh, the XI are IID given F and we give a prior on F. Uh, and then we use, uh, Judith was using scale location Gaussian mixtures uh, with a prior law on the mixing distribution. Uh, I mean, talk thought in Friedwald. Um, this is a prior, is it a model? So in a way, <laughs> it's usual story. You know? 
is a, it's a model for the unknown density. When I use a, a location mixture of Gaussian, I'm saying the true density. I'm thinking, I'm modeling the, the density as, as a mixture of Gaussian. So, and then we give a prior on its uh, a parameter, say the, the, the mixing distribution P. Uh, so Judith is insisting, and in this literature, the point is uh, when you look at the frequencies properties of Bayesian procedures, we find we we become aware uh, that fine details of the prior matter yeah. matters, which is interesting and important. And here is just a, in a way a simple question, but is are they details of the prior or of the model? Because of course we have to be careful in the choice of a model because it's the model that is conveying our information. So what we impose in the model is imposed. <laughs> and uh, so the idea underlying this, uh, I think you just explained much better is that with a mixture of Gaussian, we can approximate any density. And uh, um, so in a way the, the model we choose is very flexible. But uh, uh, the point is, uh, how good is the approximation? Is this fast? Is this efficient? Uh, um, and uh, I quote from the paper that they are very aware that, I mean, uh, this is a crucial point in, uh, in a section of the paper, but I think you explained also, I uh, say, the main difficulty in proving your results uh, for this is the kullback leibler condition. And then you write, so to do so, we need to construct an efficient approximation by mixture of, mod of normals. And impressively, we give results about the approximation rate and smaller than the bound. Um, so I think this is part of the model, no? Of four of the prior. I don't know if it is uh, useful and useful, this comment, but, uh, but it must be aware that uh, we really need to be on the, um, careful about the approximation properties. And I think the results uh, you give are also of independent interest. Everybody. So that was comment one. This comment, I, I go quickly uh, for, I mean, it's a Dirichet process uh, prior or the final version. And I was, uh, I mean, I'm aware that uh, um, the base measure is important, especially in a, in a multivariate uh, uh, setting because uh, it's, uh, well, it's the one that generates the atoms and the atoms in a multivariate setting can be very delicate to pick. Uh, but usually people think that the main uh, important parameter is the scale parameter because it controls uh, the random partition. So my quick question here is, I uh, appreciate, I, I think it's important to stress that it's, uh, I mean, in the paper and it was written that it is care must be, um, given to the choice of this base measure. I was just, uh, see, I think it's interesting and how comes where I, I think I didn't see in the, uh, the, the random partition, which is usually the core story disappears and maybe you can give us an intuition. And then comment two, uh, I mean, I was, uh, I, this is not, um, I mean, uh, manifold and, and dimension is not my area and most monoparameter. So uh, I know that it is interested in many fields in estimating the intrinsic dimension, the little d in your, uh, in your uh, uh, talk of the manifold. And, but I have a friend and colleague that I know has been working for a long time now on estimating the intrinsic uh, dimension. So I asked her, I took the liberty to give her uh, your uh, draft. And, uh, and then these are questions from Antonia Tamira. So she asked, do you need uh, to know D? So she was surprised that the rate is adaptive. And so I guess when I mean, the answer is no, because uh, the rate is adaptive, but she was insisting, well, but then uh, yeah, I have C A D in the in the rate. So would anyway, the story is, would be uh, any additional interest in your story if you also have available an estimate of the D. But the second question is, I think, uh, could be related to my story of the random partition in a way. Because uh, um, again, Antonietta says, well, it's a problem that we found uh, of interest is that the data may be generated by K distributions. So in a way, I have a mixture. <laughs> I have uh, this different distribution that generate the data live in different uh, manifolds with different dimensions. And so did you consider this possible extension? And my second consideration is maybe 
because you are so flexible in F0, it's like uh, if you have a mixture of two normals, is this one distribution or is two distributions? So how, what comments? Uh, and then I looked at some work Antoinette has been doing uh, uh, and I am pleased to uh, mention maybe the reference. Uh, I think also the second paper was perhaps going to appear in Nature or Scientific Records. A comment three, if I have a, I have a couple of three minutes or two minutes, is uh, I cannot exist uh, to say uh, something from a Bayesian Bayesian point of view. I gave a quote. Uh, so the story is in the introduction of the paper that you did. Been, it's, there is also an introduction to different approaches. So it, why is of interest in different fields uh, and different approaches? And uh, for, in this. Um, um, the paper by Judith and uh, Berenz and Rosa uh, about generative adversarial networks. They write the theoretical results associated to these approaches uh, control the error between the true generative process F0 and the estimated generative models, uh, typically under adversarial basal state distance. Uh, since the focus is more on generating interesting samples. Uh, rather than uh, on estimating the distribution per se. Generating sample, if I want to generate uh, a sample, I'm, I think of prediction. Generate one, uh, X2 given X1, and so on. So I go to my favorite uh, topic, which is prediction. I want to predict, uh, uh, so inference or prediction, the two cultures, the, the two cultures, and so on. So, uh, at least uh, this, my question is, are diff uh, different approaches or are they related uh, from a Bayesian viewpoint? Uh, one could say, well, I'm a genuine Bayesian. I wouldn't look at the model as something that exists and about that is true, but uh, models for a genuine Bayesian just tools for prediction. Uh, so it seems to different approaches and my attempt that I couldn't exist to ask uh, uh, Judith is, uh, well, it's a density estimate, but in a genuine approach is a predictive density. The, de the density estimate is the predictive density. A good uh, Bayesian estimate should be a good predictive density. What is a good predictive density? Is a predictive density of the next observation that, that incorporates well, efficiently, the information from the data. It's the second time I mentioned efficient, efficiency of your approximation in the model, efficiency here in terms of capacity of the predictive. In, in, so uh, what is the rate at which the predictive distribution incorporates uh, imaging streaming data? And I, in the predictive distribution updates the predictive of Xn plus one given the data, and then I have a new observation. So we look at this, uh, the rate at which I learn. So first uh, uh, note here is uh, the density estimate is the predictive. And also I mentioned this, uh, very recent result. I mean, for the distribution function, not for the density, uh, we have this uh, quite general result on the real line. D is capital D is one. Uh, that uh, the posterior. Oh, I forgot the most important thing. Ft given the data typo. The conditional distribution of F is the, the unknown distribution function is approximately Gaussian centered on that point the predictive distribution with a variance, the asymptotic variance there depends on this predictive updates. So if the predictive, there is a, a long story behind this. This all suggests to me, well, uh, the last, we see that the asymptotic variance depends on the predictive updates. So this means that also asymptotic credible intervals depend on predictive updates. That means that, uh, um, a poor prediction and non efficient would give a poor coverage. So, my very last words are coverage is far beyond, but rates are a first step. So, the, are the two approaches really different, or uh, one can give hints to the other? And uh, thank you again. Thank you, Sonia, for your rich discussion, for posing so many questions. Uh, now we have the last discussion of today, which is Professor Laura Ventura from, the, from our department.
Thank you, Laura, for coming and for accepting. So I would like uh, to start my discussion with the two French words, uh, chapeau, <laughs> for the impressive work, and vive la liberté, since everything is unknown. <laughs> so we, it's a, a real uh, particular framework. So uh, thanks to the scientific uh, committee for giving me the opportunity to explore this work by Judith, which is not familiar to me, of course, this framework. So as also Sonia outlined before, the paper is excellent, uh, stimulating, rigorous, uh, complete uh, in all the sections, uh, and uh, actual in particular on uh, uh, non-parametric Bayesian density, density estimation in high dimensional statistical problems. So before my, I don't have questions. <laughs> I only have some, um, I need some uh, clarifications from you since uh, my necessary premise is that I'm parametric with my assumed central model. So I only admit some small deviation from my model when I use robust statistics. So I have an epsilon a neighborhood of my model, which is perhaps similar to your tube. Then uh, I'm uh, starting from my PhD. I'm in love with small sample problems. <laughs> so my, I have a typically N, which is small. I found a paper by Tang and Reed on modified likelihood root in high dimensions. So there is a connection between uh, higher order asymptotics and uh, high dimensional, but we need the likelihood that it's uh, parametric. And uh, finally, I am more frequentist, more often frequentist than Bayesian. And if I am Bayesian, I'm hybrid. So <laughs> I use frequentist tools in my, in my analysis. So the context uh, of the paper by Judith and of the talk, and in particular, uh, the common feature of the talk of this conference uh, is that uh, nowadays data may reflect the complexity of the, the reality. So we can have data that may be functional, hierarchical, high dimension. They can come from different source, complex dependent structures and so on. And the idea is to, uh, to go from complexity to simplicity. So in a high dimensional statistical problems, uh, it is common to consider that as in Judith talk, the observations really live in a smaller dimensional structure. So the effective dimension of the, the problem may be simpler, so simplicity, if one can take advantage of the geometry of the data. Um, in this framework, uh, there, there have been a growing interest uh, in the so-called manifold hypothesis, uh, where the data is believed to be or to be near supported on a low dimensional manifold M. So when the manifold is no prior to the experiment, everything is simple. But if the, most, if the manifold is uh, uh, unknown, so we are closer in spirit to a dimensional reduction approach, then the situation can be drastically <laughs> different. And uh, so both M and its geometry are unknown and they are considered in the analysis as a nuisance parameter. So also Judith admits some small deviation <laughs> from the manifold. So we have data which are a sample from an unknown density. Uh, this density has support which is concentrated near a low dimensional manifold. And the goal is to study the estimation of the density near this manifold. So uh, the data are assumed to, to, be, to belong to a neighborhood of uh, the manifold where everything is uh, known. So this is the reason with La Liberté. You don't know uh, nothing, M, D, F0, and also the, the width of the tube that you are considering. So you like uh, to place in a usual framework where the support of the distribution is unknown while uh, your aim is to recover the density at a particular point, uh, which is known to be on the support. So it is very particular framework. And your goal uh, is to study the con posterior concentration rate. So the posterior concentration rate uh, is uh, the notion of Bayesian consistency. 
quantifying the speed at which the posterior distribution concentrates on arbitrary small neighborhoods of the true model when n goes to infinity. So you want to, to study in the operator the, the posterior probability that a particular distance between the density estimation and the, your the unknown estimation goes to one in probability for a particular class of priors which are based, uh, which are families of location and scale and mixture of Gaussian distributions. Uh, so the contribution of the paper R3, the, the first one is that uh, Judith provide the general setting for studying density support at the near is a manifold. So you give this uh, definition of a general manifold anisotropic order function. And uh, there is a particular role of this smoothness parameter vector. Then uh, you provide the family of flexible priors, uh, the location scale of the Richelieu mixture of Gaussian priors. And then the third great result is uh, uh, that the posterior, you demonstrate that the posterior concentration rate depends on the smoothness of the density, on the dimensions, uh, capital D and small d, and of the thickness of the support around the manifold delta. So I have only some curiosities, <laughs> they are not comments on questions. So a first uh, result, uh, which is for me very interesting is that the, your priors, uh, the, the class of priors that you consider does not depend uh, on beta, on delta, on m, in particular on the small d, uh, since the condition that you give for the priors really depend on this. Uh, so I found the, this result uh, quite remarkable. And uh, well, I wonder if, uh, if other possible mixtures of priors can reach the res this result, uh, for instance, uh, the Fischer Gaussian kernels. The second question uh, is thinking about my deviation from my parametric model. So I can understand my deviations in the robust theory. So when the data naturally on this uh, uh, neighborhood of the manifold, and uh, well, well, this is a question also in your slides, uh, what about the values of delta in practice? Since uh, in, the, in the robust approach, uh, we work with small epsilon of, of small deviations from the model, and in particular when delta goes to zero. Since uh, in the robust approach, when the, the delta goes to zero, we add the central model. Um, well, another curiosity is uh, if in general your procedures uh, with respect to some small values of delta or larger values of delta uh, can give signals of wrong assumption or identifiability problems, uh, or if your methods can be used to test this hypothesis. So the idea is, for example, when you have particular concentrated densities uh, in which, uh, um, which suggest a, a change in the curvature on an extra, extra dimension of the sub-manifold. Um, well, the, this uh, first curiosity is related to the last comment of Sonia, I think that uh, you use the Hellinger distance in order to prove uh, your see, okay, your consistency. So uh, with this distance, you have that the posterior concentration rates uh, induces also a convergence uh, on the posterior mean. So point estimation, interval estimation. So see if you have also some consequences uh, for interval estimation. And then uh, well, I'm more practical <laughs> than you. So the last. Curiosity is uh, what about the interest in practice, in practical problems uh, of thinking that the data sits near a submanifold or a subdimensional space, uh, and what it may mean, might mean in terms of a production uh, dimension. So thanks again for your talk. Laura from, for your nice comments. And there are questions from the audience. Uh, I have a, a curiosity, a, like a practical implication of this, because um, 
we know that in high dimension location scale mixture are somehow problematic because uh, each kernel has a, a, a matrix, a location, a scale matrix, which may lead to some difficulties in, in computation or convergence or, or similar things. So I wonder if the, the partial location that you're proposing, which achieve these nice properties and the way of dividing the actual scale of the kernel from, from the shape, so the actual covariance track is going to help in this or do you have any, any idea if you have also issues in high dimension for, for, for the presence of a big matrix to be estimated in each component? And thank you for the wonderful talk. Other questions from the audience? No. Okay, okay. so uh, I'm answering. So uh, like Irene, I'll ask with the last question because I'm a short memory process and I will forget it by the end. Um, so um, I think your question is my question. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, in a, so in high, my hope is that, yeah, there are two types of rhetoric. I, I, I guess what you're talking about is in terms of computations, like uh, are we running into troubles from a computational point of view when D, capital D becomes large? Well, maybe not because dividing these two aspects of the domain of the scale matrix maybe be faster than yeah, I don't know. So, so if I were able to run a sampler that would uh, scale well, um, my hope is that uh, these uh, location, this partial location scale, uh, would allow you not to be too disturbed by this. I mean, yeah, I think the location scale, like if you leave the location scale completely free. The more I it, the more I, I work on these objects, the less I trust them. And so you need some constraints one way or the other. Um, but that's outside computational point of view. It's like, it's really like as a model in a sense. So that now I sort of answering Tonya's question. Uh, yeah, pure location scale with no constraints like this conjugate version, I really don't trust them anymore, even in finite mixtures. Um, now, whether it's a model or whether it's a prior, it's a yeah, it's a funny game. In in the density estimation, uh, in non-parametric non-parametric uh, models, or uh, yeah, the likelihood is totally driven by the prior then, because somehow you think about it as non-parametric, so you're modeling the density, and you find a way to parameterize your density with a possibly infinite number of parameters. And this way that you find to model your density as a possible number, infinite, possibly infinite number of parameters gives you a model. But it's also a prior. It's the initial process in the, the model. Yeah, 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 you can, you can think about it. So, so, but it's interesting, the point that you were making in particular, like the fact that people are very careful in the choice of the mass, the A's or the, the mass is, uh, I don't know how you call that. I think. Okay. Yeah, scale parameter. I would call it the mass, but of this Dirichlet process, where uh, from the theoretical point of view, what came out was uh, the critical critical aspect were the covariances in the in the location in the mixtures. And so, what it tells me, uh, and that's the only thing I, that I sort of it tells me, is that um, asymptotically the covariances do not disappear. So, what you put in your prior on the covariances, it doesn't disappear asymptotically. And so what doesn't disappear asymptotically for me is crucial. What disappears, so the, the mass, it disappears asymptotically, which means that it, it might still be crucial if you don't have so many observations, but when the number of observations start increasing, it becomes less and less crucial. And so, whereas if it doesn't disappear asymptotically, you have to be super careful. In, so for me, asymptotics is only there to, I guess it's because I'm, I don't know, I'm pessimistic, but like whatever whatever happens asymptotically, so if it works, it's reassuring, but it doesn't mean that what you're doing is good. If it doesn't work, it means what you're doing is bad. And so yeah, yeah, so so some aspect of your prior or model do not disappear asymptotically. So I think about them as prior because I'm putting F not. My, my my true density, I, I'm not modeling it as a, as a, in my head, they are not mixture of normals. My F naught, it's a smooth density and I'm, I'm trying to not put too many assumptions on them. And so I, if, if I think about it that way, then it becomes a prior. 
but there is a, I mean, it's like it's a blurred version of the plot, prior and modeling. Huh? Is that, I don't know if it answers your, your question. But really, so so A disappears. So the impact of A disappears asymptotically. It doesn't mean that it's not important. It's just that it disappears asymptotically. In, in terms of the rate, it's not there. Whereas the covariance is there. So it's one step more important, I would say. Um, yeah, so then, uh, so these mixtures, um, that, so with like mixtures with different dimensions. So, so uh, I'm just going on with your uh, visual. I, I noted, and so the one, so the Antonio Tagmiras uh, comments the fact that if, if you had different uh, manifolds in a sense with different dimensions and the data lived in the sort of the collections of these manifolds, uh, the methods would would apply. Now to prove anything on the methods, uh, I. I what you could prove is that the rate that you get is the worst of the rates, so that's for sure. But you and uh, and it would still work, and I think you can prove that easily. So that's not a problem. You're, 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 exactly. So 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 yeah. So so you can, but you can now. I'm pretty sure that locally the rate would be the good one, but proving that is much more complicated. And the thing is that mixtures are complex objects, and proving local rates. So the, the, instead of looking at the global loss, which is the Hellinger loss on the whole, whole space, you look at local losses, uh, which are pointwise losses or things like that. It's funny because the kernel estimators frequency version, they have like very natural way of proving results. With a Bayesian, you're totally screwed up. It doesn't, it, proving anything local is very, very complicated. And so we have results on some simple priors, but with mixtures, we are nowhere close to there. But it's a very important question. I agree. I don't, but I don't know how to prove it there. But my guess is that it should work. But it should work if you had these hybrid location scale mixtures, not the partial location scale mixtures, because the hybrid allows you to 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 choose to to look for different dimensions depending on where you are in the space. That's what it it allows you in particular, or different smoothness. It's about the same. Um, then you have your last comment. I'll try to be, I know you're really hungry. But uh, so the last comment is, um, I really like your idea on uh, uh, trying, so trying to get credible intervals. Uh, it's a bit like Newton's algorithm and your result with Sandra Forcini and I'm fascinated by this paper all the time. But uh, 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 I think it's a very good idea because so uh, it sort of, it sort of, it, um, it sort of points to my last point by saying, uh, well, we know we have a rather fast algorithms for the map. I mean, we, I mean, we just plug in something that exists in the literature. So, so for the map, and then maybe using your, your sort of predictive approach and this sort of asymptotic normality that you get a bit like in Newton's algorithm, we can use this fast algorithm for the map and add, add this Vers layer or Gaussian layer around. And that might be a way to get uncertainty instead of having to simulate the whole posterior. And essentially what you know is that one is close to the other. So yeah, it's just, yeah, it's a super good idea. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the, so Laura, uh, robustness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I was trying to sort of have answers. Uh, one thing, could we prove results for the other kernels, uh, like the Fisher, or the one by David Dunson? Um, yeah, I think you just, so to get the results, so the only thing that you need, uh, the only thing yeah, that you need to do is the approximation theory that we, that we did. Uh, I think because these Fisher kernels, they, they have a Gaussian component. So probably you can adapt what we've done to these Gaussian mixtures to these Fisher mixtures. But uh, we haven't tried. But it's it, it's probably something you can get it. And I guess also, for instance, instead of if you saw that your data were all positive, for instance, like for, so, you instead of mixture of normals, you think like mixture of gammas. And um, and so I haven't done it at there at all. But we have this result with with Natalia Boschkina for mixture of gammas. What, what happened is what's funny is that this gamma the, is the parameter of the gammas, and there is a parameterization of the gamma, which is a bit like a location scale parameterization. And maybe you can play the same sort of games because if the scale of the gamma goes to infinity, then the gamma looks like a Gaussian. And so you can rebuild you. So there are things that might actually work also for other types of mixtures. But uh, yeah, I, I haven't, it's probably quite complicated. Uh, I guess I have to stop because uh, we can discuss for the rest. <laughs> Thank you.